Okay, I'm going to continue on today from um, yesterday. And um, um, talk, continue talking about intermolecular forces. Now, intermolecular forces, you remember, are attractive forces between two molecules. Okay, it could be molecules of, of the, that are the same or different. The molecules are different, then we're talking about solubility questions. So if a solute, which is the, the um, minor part, is one and the solvent, which is the major part of a solution, are different, then it's going to not enhance the solubility. If they're the same, polar, polar, non-polar, non-polar, then the solubility is going to be enhanced. Okay, there's an expression called like dissolves like, and that's where it comes from, intermolecular forces. So you need to look at a molecule and identify which parts or functional groups are are polar and nonpolar. And once the, on the column on the left, all I've done is move these guys over here. Notice there's lots of oxygens, lots of oxygens. So as soon as you see oxygens in there, think polar. Like I've been saying all along, we were looking at um, the Vesper stuff, whether they're polar or nonpolar, I said, look for the oxygen. Again, as soon as you start seeing oxygen, particularly if they're bonded to a hydrogen. Nitrogens, kind of in the same boat. Bonded to a hydrogen, you have hydrogen bonding, particularly strong. <clears throat> Now, this paragraph here talks about hydrophobic and hydrophilic, which pertains to water solubility, but it doesn't just apply to water, apply to anything. If your solvent is pentane, pentane is very nonpolar. So molecules that have these guys in are not going to dissolve very well. If the predominance is on this other column here with CHs and CCs, then those are going to want to dissolve better in those, okay? So like dissolves like, regardless of whether it's water or not. Hydrophilicity and hydrophobic just happens to be water, which is a very polar solvent. But it, I want to emphasize it does not have to be water. <clears throat> concept of miscibility or immiscibility has to do with whether two liquids will become homogeneous or not. If the two liquids are not homogeneous, they're immiscible. Okay? In other words, they'll layer out. You look at this example, pentane, again, is very nonpolar, water, very polar. Like dissolves like. Immiscibility is a very similar concept. I end up layering out. Vinaigrette. Vinaigrette, think of it as oil. Vinegar. Oil is very nonpolar. Vinegar is very polar. Hence, they're immiscible. What, what can we do to fix this? How can we make these go from immiscible to miscible? What can we add? Huh? An emulsifier, yeah. right. And remember, emulsifier has got, it's a big molecule, usually pretty good size, and it's got one polar part and one nonpolar part. So it sticks them together. 
We've already talked about hydrogen bonding, NOF. Hydrogen bonding to any of those is a very high delta EN. Hence, the dipole is very large. That's why it's a very strong intermolecular force. If it's hydrogen, it's hydrogen bonding. <clears throat> now, when we get down to these really strong IMFs, because of electronegativity, the, electro the higher electronegativity part will pull electrons from an adjacent neighbor, in this case, hydrogen. So this tends to be more negative than normal. This tends to be more positive than normal. And we're gonna use those little squiggly lines again, squiggly delta. So this is gonna be So in a situation when you have multiple molecules of water, you're gonna get some attraction there. And because it's hydrogen bonded, it's particularly strong. Um, ethanol looks like this. So ethanol is a very polar molecule because it's got hydrogen bonding. So ethanol is a good solvent for water and vice versa. Like dissolves like, also known as vodka. When you look at a bottle of vodka, there is no separation between the water and the ethanol. It's 100 proof that's 50% ethanol, 50% water, no separation. That means they're miscible. They're miscible because they're both alike, both polar. When you take pentane, a nonpolar solvent, and throw it in gasoline, again, it becomes miscible because gasoline is mostly octane, which is nonpolar. The pentane is nonpolar. Put them together, and you don't see any distinction between the two. So those are miscible. Okay, that concept of miscibility is totally dependent on the polarity or the IMFs of the constituents. Now, Okay, hydrogen bonding is the strongest IMF. But it's only two to five percent as strong as a covalent intramolecular. Now remember, IMFs are inter between molecules, intra is within the molecule. Usually Forces within the molecule are stronger than between molecules because they're much closer together. And in the case of a covalent bond, it's much, they're much more stable. <clears throat> the more hydrogen, excuse me, back up, the more IMF forces are in play, the higher the boiling point the stickier it is. So if you look at this molecule here,
And the difference between the two is One's got one hydroxyl group, the other has two hydroxyl groups, because we have double the hydrogen bonding as that, you're gonna have a much more higher influence on the boiling point. You can see it's reflected uh, here. These are not the same molecules. Um, let me modify this somewhat here. Okay, so here we have hydrogen bonding, no hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding stronger than dipole-dipole uh, bonding. Hence, because it's hydrogen bonding, the boiling point is going to be higher. If we looked at this one, which has two hydrogen bonded hydroxyl groups, it would look something like this. That would be ethadiol. So ethane is the backbone. Di means two, all, so two hydroxyl groups. Ethanol, backbone is two, one hydroxyl group. <clears throat> okay, so again, the more polar the functional group, higher the boiling point. And okay, there's a direct correlation there. Now, when we get into solutions, the ionic character of the solvent is really important because that's going to affect the behavior between the solvent and the solute. If the solute happens to be an ion, there's going to be an ionic and partially ionic interaction there. In fact, this is called the hydration sphere. When water surrounds each cation and anion, called the hy hydration sphere. So again, like dissolves like. So we take a salt crystal, throw it into water. What happens is, is the, the highly polar water solvent molecules pulls those sodium and chloride ions out of the crystal. If we had a more polar solvent than water, it would even make it dissolve faster. An ionic solid is extremely polar. So it likes polar solvents, like dissolves like. 
And how this works, <clears throat> but a uh, star by this, make sure you understand this concept of how something ionic will dissolve easily in water, okay? So what, because water is so polar, because of the hydrogen bonding here, it becomes a cationic and an anionic solvent, which allows it to pull out the anionic solute and the cationic sol uh, solute. Okay, so um, uh, say again. Does that split up the ionic compound or are they still oh, isolated together? It actually splits it up. Remember, we talked about um, crystal lattice force and solvating force. Now that goes back to this relationship. No, no. Although that's sort of how they, they, they make chlorine gas from salt. Just an it's called an electrolysis process, which is an oxidative reductive rather than this. I guess that's if that breaks it up sodium and chlorine, why is it not part of it? Salt water isn't harmful unless you drink too much of it. Uh, or you happen to drop an electrical device in the water. <laughs> but uh, but chlorine and sodium are pretty hazardous chemicals on their own. So if they're being split up uh, apart, why are they not? And why are they not? Okay, that's an interesting question. Okay, so we have chlorine. Remember, chlorine by itself doesn't exist by itself. It exists how? Okay. It's not ionic. Sodium metal is not ionic. It's not particularly stable, but it's not ionic. So it's keeping from being formed into the water, keeps it from being formed into the it's stable. No, it comes that way. The water, the water doesn't make it that way. It comes that way. I'm just, and because the sodium ion is particularly stable, chlorine ion is particularly stable. So in nature, that's why you form the sodium chloride salt. Okay, so the water, it dissolving in water has nothing to do with the state of the sodium or the chloride. All it's doing, it's pulling it out of the crystal. That's all it's doing. It's not affecting it at all. Is that? Not, not really. I mean, does that do why is chlorine not hazardous? Um, is it because it's, it's because it's not it's not Cl two, it's Cl minus. Okay. That's exactly okay. why it's not. And your body needs both of those. Okay, um, they're very different. And chlorine gas is used like in World War Two is one of the one of the gases to poison people in the field. It's bad stuff. Uh, sodium metal, it doesn't exist in nature. You've got to make it because it's so unstable. Okay. But the I corresponding ions are super stable. Okay, so they, because they've been pre already been ionized by their reaction with each other, even though they're pulled apart, they're still good to go. Yeah, or they're uh, formed that way by some other reaction, and then afterwards they come together. Okay. E either way. Cool. Yeah. So are there, for the ion dipole forces, does that mean that there's uh, cation dipole forces and anion dipole forces? Or is it just? It depends on the end of the dipole. A di dipole has both a plus and a minus. So I mean, like, if you go to take away, like, the sodium, then would you have the uh, cation dipole? Yes, as long as you match it up with something else. It's got to match. Like water. No, it's got to match something as see water is partially positive and partially negative, not full on. Okay. So, so what is that diagram at the bottom? Yes. This? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so sodium is a full on plus one cation. Chlorine is a full on negative one anion. 
these guys are partially positive and partially negative. And it depends on what part of the molecule is positive or negative, because it's a dipole. So the part that's the opposite charge, the opposite to this is what? Negative. So the negative part of the water is what's attracted to it. Okay. And then... Full blown plus a negative one ion anion. Okay. So what's attracted to it? It's got to be the opposite in the water part, which is the two hydrogens, which are plus. Okay, so a polar molecule has got a little of each. A cation only has positive, an anion only has negative. And so when those are submerged in the water can pull it apart because it was attracted. Now, I want to repeat this. Two competing, competing forces. There's solvating force Both of those are going on simultaneously. Simultaneously. In the case of sodium chloride, the solvating force of water is greater than the crystal lattice force keeping it together. Hence, it dissolves. You always have those two competing forces going on. <clears throat> Okay, so the LDF are the weakest, but all molecules have them. And they're also additive, like I gave you the uh, uh, Geronimo and uh, Lone Ranger uh, analogy. Put a lot of weak forces together, collectively they become strong. The more atoms, is directly proportional to the net strength and you know, the dispersion forces. So basically, the more atoms, because Every atom has an LDF in it. Every atom has got a dispersion force in it. So the more atoms you have, the more dispersion force you have. Still weak though, very, very weak. But if you get enough of them together, and think about biological molecules. Biological molecules in general tend to be large, very large. For example, proteins can have 100,000 amino acids attached together to form a protein. They tend to be very large. Molar masses are like 1.2 million grams per mole. I mean, really large molecules. Hydrogen bonds. Strongest. And remember, um, fluorine is not generally present in biological systems. Hence, it's frequently used to kill biological systems. A lot of pesticides have got fluorine in it. A lot of antibiotics, fluorine in it, because it kills organisms, as well as triple bonds.
<laughs> okay, so <laughs> some some textbooks put ionic bonds as also intermolecular forces. <laughs> <laughs> if we look at a diagram So if this is increasing strength, the dispersion force at the bottom, oh, <laughs> ionic bond is the top. Because ionic bond um, is sort of not connected. Really, the only thing they keep it together is the flat out attraction. So some books put this in the mix. Okay, so that's what they're alluding to here. So ionic bond, strongest. So whenever you have anything with ionic bonds in it and another molecule's got hydrogen bonding in it, those are usually very compatible, like dissolves, like. Okay, so here's a nice diagram of strength, which is kind of like what we just talked about. And there's another interesting phenomenon um, called surface tension. Okay, so we've talked about attraction is a force. That means it's a vector. It has direction and quantity, or magnitude. So if we looked at the surface, this is why a lot of things float on water. Um, uh, water striders, there's a lot of insects that can walk on water. That's because of surface tension of water. We look at a molecule in the middle of a container of water, say. We've got forces 360 degrees, three dimensional around that molecule. If we move that molecule to the surface, that no longer exists. We're missing part of the submerged molecule right here. So molecules that are at the surface are different, undergo different forces than submerged molecules. And because if you look at the net now, we have four vectors all canceling one another. On the right here, we have three vectors not canceling. So those cancel, those cancel. The bottom one does not cancel. So what happens is
So all the top molecules are attracted downward. The only thing left over is the downward force. Hence, this forms a stronger boundary than inside here. Surface tension. Now, there's a lot of ways to change surface tension. Let me give you an example. When I lived in Florida, when I was a little kid, I lived on base, home state Air Force Base. <clears throat> Florida has a whole bunch of mosquitoes in there. It's like summer in the Dakotas, right? <laughs> Lots of mosquitoes or Alaska. Now, the deal is um, mosquitoes lay their eggs on the surface of the water and they float down a little bit. So the base used to spray your yard with gasoline. And it used to rain a lot down there too. So we'd end up with puddles all over the place, with little areas of gasoline floating on the top of the water. What do you think that did to mosquitoes breeding? What happens is it reduced the surface tension of the water because gasoline floats. <clears throat> they use something like gasoline. It, it could have been diesel, some kind of a, a nonpolar solvent. And Um, for now, let's just call it gasoline in parentheses. Now the problem is the mosquito is assuming a very tight boundary up here, high surface tension. You know, when they land, they don't have that. So what happens is they lay their eggs and they sink down and they're suffocated. So that was the basis. Base did two things to cut down mosquitoes. The other thing they did was to spray DDT in the neighborhood. And they would fog the neighborhood with DDT. And get, guess what? So they were, there was this um, pickup truck pulling a cart about like this and had an engine on it that would look like a cloud, a billowing cloud. Guess what all the neighbor kids used to love to do? Exactly. We used to all, I thought that was the funniest thing. So I have, and DDT breaks down to TTT, <clears throat> which is that soluble. And the only reason you can, the only way to get rid of it out of your body is to get rid of the fat tissue that it's absorbed in. So I probably have leftover TTT in my body. Now, if I was a bird, my egg, a female bird, my eggs would be very soft. And they usually break by the time they're mature. So anyway, they're thinking about taking, pulling that back, by the way, reintroducing DDT. The reason for that is um, there's a lot of diseases now that are transmitted by mosquitoes. <laughs> and DDT worked really well on mosquitoes. Okay. Well, it killed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, so it's third world countries could give a rip. They don't care about anything long term. If DDG. <laughs> <laughs> Kills them short term, have at it. Okay. Um, all right. So, how can we change the surface tension? One is to increase the temperature. Okay. Because remember, temperature is a metric that measures motion of the molecule. <laughs> so if the molecule is moving 
faster, then that surface is going to it's going to be disrupted. It's like look at <laughs> like look at it at a lake with no wind, nice and calm. Start introducing waves and stuff into that more and more wind. Things don't settle down as easily. Same idea with surface tension. Okay, so it raises the average kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. Another term with liquids is something called viscosity. Something that's very viscous doesn't flow very well. For example, um, petroleum jelly versus uh, pentane. Uh, Vaseline is basically petroleum jelly uh, made from a hydrocarbon and very nonpolar. Pentane is very polar. I mean, excuse me, uh, pentane is very nonpolar. So the polarity of both of them are very similar. Yet one, when you you can turn it upside down and nothing happens. The other one, you turn it upside down, it just pours right out. So one is more viscous than the other. Viscosity is the resistance to flow for a liquid. That's the unit of viscosity. Now notice there is a <clears throat> velocity is meters per second. And notice there is a second in there. It's goofy units, but basically it's it's a unit of of uh, flow. Okay, so mass affects viscosity. Just look at an elephant versus a mouse. Which is more viscous? Elephants, a lot bigger, right? Elephants can move probably as fast as a mouse, and a mouse is hippopotamus can move as fast as a mouse also. Not for very long, but they can move uh, pretty fast too. <clears throat> So that's the point here is increasing velocity, excuse me, increasing mass, increasing viscosity, directly proportional. And we get back into intermolecular forces again here. The more the IMF in a molecule, based in its environment's IMF, will affect viscosity. The shape will also affect viscosity. Marbles roll easier than dice. Why? Because they're round. So molecules that tend to be round in shape are less viscous than the ones that are more rigid in shape. Kepler reaction, another interesting uh, phenomenon. <clears throat> in your burette, when you have water in there, the water forms a meniscus. And that meniscus on one side is attracted to the glass because water and glass are very similar molecular uh, molecules. So they're attracted to one another. If the liquid in the burette was not polar, like mercury, for example, if you go in the back and look at the mercury barometer on the wall, it doesn't have a meniscus, it has an inverted meniscus. That's because mercury and glass are not 
ionically compatible. They're not, they're not, um, the uh, ionic attraction for them are not compatible. Hence, it doesn't want to get near the edge, so it's round. So, Okay, so glass is silicon dioxide, sand, and water, both polar. Lots of oxygens, lots of oxygens. Hence the water likes this a lot. The closer it gets to the glass edge, the more the attraction is increased. Hence that's why it climbs up the closer you get. Okay, closer you get, climbs up because the interaction is stronger. When you're looking at something that are not compatible, the closer you get to that incompatibility, the more it wants to be away from it. So you get an inverted meniscus. So if I put vegetable oil in the burette, what would the meniscus look like? Yeah. Right side, can you say right side like this? Right. Yeah, so water and glass are very similar. Okay, so if we put vegetable in a glass container, it's not going to mix because one's nonpolar, one's polar. So as we get to the edge, the interaction is going to be less and less to the point where it wants to stay away from the edge. So it's going to look like this. So if this was vegetable oil in a burette, it's going to look like humped. The narrower the distance, the more pronounced the meniscus is. So if you had a really wide beaker and a really skinny burette, same phenomenon is going on, it just when it wouldn't be as noticeable. Okay, notice the wider versus the narrower. When it's narrow, the interaction is greater because there's more contact area. The wider it is, the interaction is less because there's less contact area. No. So the one on the right is the mercury. And notice it's an inverted meniscus. This is some kind of polar liquid. Could be water, could be acetic acid, could be vinegar. Normal meniscus, okay? So it has to do with the interaction between the container and the liquid. We'll determine whether there's a cap capillary action or whether there's a meniscus or an inverted meniscus. 
Okay, when we look at a beaker full of water, a lot of things are going on at the microscopic level. And this is kind of what our lab is about today. Okay, we've got molecules in here, and then we have a distribution of kinetic energy of those molecules. Okay, so we're looking at kinetic energy versus velocity, the speed of those molecules moving around. Some are super slow, some are super fast, and the average is gonna be in here. So most of them fall in this area here. How can we change that shape of that curve? What surface area? Um, that would have a, a minor effect. That would change it, though. But what would change it a lot? Pressure. Let's assume the pressure is constant. And pressure would, by the way. Yeah. Temperature. temperature. Remember, temperature is a metric or motion of the molecules. So if the blue is, let's say, 80 degrees, we jacked up the temperature from 80 to 100, okay. The shape of the curve is the same. What's the difference between 80 and 100? Hmm? Your greater velocity. Yeah, the average velocity has increased. Remember, because this area here for the red is the average velocity, and for the blue, average velocity. So everything is shifted to the right. Everything is shifted to increased velocity. Okay, is everyone okay with that? <laughs> I remember in this bucket of water, We've got at the surface of the water, we have surface tension. Okay, remember the surface tension is stickier than the bottom part. So if we have a molecule of water zooming along here, <laughs> and <it> just like, <laughs> and then, and it decides to go this way. What's going to stop it? Or what could stop it? Huh? Surface tension, exactly. Because remember, the surface is stickier than the rest. OK. However, however, we've got some fast molecules regardless of the temperature. So they have sufficient kinetic energy to go through the surface tension. Yeah. Why does it go back down? Like why couldn't you theoretically not just like keep sure to increase the velocity? If it could like each molecule have like a capacity. It's just totally probability. 
okay. It's, it's just some are slow, some are fast. The average is in the middle. Okay. It's, it's so think of it like all of them. Yeah, think of it as a Gaussian curve. You got one standard deviation, two standard, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So on the average, her, her question had to relate to um is and every every one is gonna have the same curve. It's just where's the average? Okay. As you increase temperature, the average increases. You still have slow ones and you still have fast ones. Fast one, fast ones are gonna escape. The slower ones won't. So as we increase temperature, what do we do to that to that um, system? Okay, we increase velocity. That's right. What happens when we go from liquid to gas? Where do we go? How do these guys get up? Why are they above surface? Guys here. This guy versus this guy. What's the difference? Yeah. Huh? That's right. But why is it up here? That's right. I totally agree with that. Yeah. It's faster, and the faster it is, the easier it is to escape the surface and become a gas. Okay, so by increasing temperature, we've increased the average velocity of the liquid water, allowing more liquid water to have enough velocity to go through the barrier here. That's called boiling. So when you start getting close to 100 degrees, you start seeing a little bit of steam, but not a lot of steam. That's because you're looking at the molecules that had sufficient kinetic energy to escape this barrier here. The closer we get to boiling, the more and more molecules want to go from liquid to gas. Okay, And it has to do with this relationship here. So as we move this further and further to the right, we have more and more average velocity molecules that have the kinetic energy to escape. <clears throat> okay, that's a really important concept. One that we always have slow molecules. We always have fast molecules, period. No exceptions. What's different between one temperature and another is the average. Now, this looks like a bell-shaped curve. And this is a Gaussian distribution. So this group in the middle here, as it shifts to the right, more and more molecules have sufficient kinetic energy to go through that barrier. So the definition of boiling point is when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals atmospheric pressure. That's officially boiling. <clears throat> so we look at that distribution, a certain amount of them will have sufficient kinetic energy to break through. Notice that the red versus the blue. The blue has a lower average temperature than the red. Hence, there are less of them that has sufficient kinetic energy to get through that barrier, surface barrier. And the opposite also happens. Those gas molecules, if they lose enough of their energy, they're not going to have enough energy to stay a gas. They become liquid again. So when a gas becomes a liquid, it's called condensation.
Okay, so condensation and evaporation or boiling are opposite operations. Now your lab on Thursday, we're gonna talk about something called colligative forces. Attractive forces, that's called IMS, intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces will affect the boiling because they're attracted to one another. Hence, the average kinetic energy has to be more to overcome that attractiveness. So the more attractive they are, more energy needs to be applied to get them into boiling. Also, the surface tension is going to be different based on the solvent molecules. So the surface tension is going to be stickier as well. So IMFs are very integral to talking about concept of evaporation and condensation. Now, interestingly, If we have 100 molecules, and of the 120 have enough kinetic energy to leave, that means we have 80 molecules that are going to be a different distribution now, because we don't have the fast ones anymore. So that means... So your average temperature or average kinetic energy now is going to be less because we don't have those 20 fast molecules anymore contributing to the distribution. So it's like you know, on a football team, all your star players go to the go to the finals when you're left with what? Your team isn't as effective. So all your star players are gone. And in this case, all your fast molecules are gone. So your overall temperature decreases. So there is a value for vaporization and condensation. So these are integral related inverse processes. They're related through, they're the same, but they're related through a sign. <clears throat> now let's look at these values here. So notice the boiling point of water is much greater than these guys. This is what their structure looks like. 
So how many hydrogen bonds are in water? How many OH bonds are in water? Two. There's an OH and there's an OH, right? How many are in isopropyl alcohol? One. How many here? Zero. But there is a dipole-dipole carbon oxygen. And here there is like a dipole dipole as well. So decreasing decreasing intermolecular forces. <clears throat> Hence decreasing boiling point. Because remember, the stickier it is, the more energy is needed to get that thing into, into vapor, also known as a boiling point. OK? And we have something called equilibrium. Equilibrium uh, <laughs> at a certain temperature, we're gonna have molecules leaving <laughs> with adequate kinetic energy to escape. <laughs> then we have molecules re-entering the liquid because of their kinetic energy has gone down for some reason, usually collision or whatever. And that process is equal. So one's coming equals going. And that's what they're talking about in this closed container equilibrium. So at time zero, we have a closed container. At time zero, Certain molecules are going to start leaving the liquid going to the gas phase. As time goes on, time one, we have finally the amount of goings and comings are equal. That's the equilibrium point. Okay. So what happens is it goes and goes and goes. <laughs> until equilibrium is reached. So what this graph shows is the rate of evaporation. Okay. That's how many are leaving. Rate of condensation. <laughs> In the beginning. So in the beginning, time zero, this is this is what we have. Okay. So in the beginning, there's no rate of constant. Uh, Evaporation is really going strong. But the stuff falling back is nothing. But as closer we get to this time zero, then it, they're the same. So graphically, that's what it looks like. Microscopically, this is what it looks like. Now, this assumes constant volume. If we change the volume, that process is going to be different. As the volume goes down, it's harder and harder to 
for these dyes to get into the gaseous phase. So as volume goes down, Okay, um, temperature dependence of vapor pressure, okay? That's what we talked about here. As temperature increases, the number of molecules having the required amount of kinetic energy to escape the barrier increases. This is the average, the average. That's what they're talking about here. So the temperature increases the amount of vapor, the amount of oxygen, the amount of molecules that are gaseous. That's what temperature increases to. And again, it depends on the intermolecular forces of the molecules we're talking about. What this is saying is water Highly polar takes the longest to get up to equilibrium because those water molecules are sticky to one another, requiring lots and lots of energy to get up there. Diethyl ether, only thing it has going for it are two uh, CO dipoles, and they're actually uh, opposite as well. So it's it doesn't have very many, um, not a very polar molecule. So it just goes right away. This guy here has got one hydroxyl group. This has got two. So this has half the amount of uh, hydrogen bonding as water. So it's going to take less time than water. So when the vapor pressure of the liquid equals the external pressure, that's when boiling occurs. Now, if the external pressure is atmospheric pressure, and you change atmospheric pressure, then you have more and more molecules have the ability to escape because the external pressure is lower. For example, if we go up to Lake Tahoe and boil water, what does water at uh, Lake Tahoe boil at? 100 degrees? Greater or lower than 100 degrees? Lower, because the pressure is lower at higher elevations. Hence, more molecules can get to this quicker. because you don't have to have sufficient kinetic energy to escape. And when the pressure is super high, like in a pressure cooker, you have to get the temperature even higher to make it boil. Hence, that's why pressure cookers cook faster, like Instant Pot, for example. Okay, so the concept of boiling is when the amount of kinetic energy or vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure upon it. Then things boil. Um, the lower external pressure, the lower the boiling point. Again, Mount Everest, I'm talking about 29,000 feet. 78 degrees, water boils. That's because the pressure is a lot less. So the amount of kinetic energy required to become gas is less. So 
close to sea level. And we've talked about this curve before. And that flat spot is the phase change. So we have a solid going to liquid, liquid going to a gas. Solid and liquid phase change, liquid gas phase change. Okay. <clears throat> we are. going to end this here. And then tomorrow I want to pick up here to explain the lab we're doing today. Okay? All right, I will...